That would take us back to probably about the fourth or fifth grade. It is very early. It's hard to explain how those kinds of things happen in individual lives, but I just began to develop this very keen interest in, in government. Of course, I had no sophistication, but it uh, in part took the form of wanting to be a class officer, and so I was mm -hmm. president in my fifth grade, and, and then on into the seventh and eighth. One memory is that uh, the day I began service was the day that Tom McCall left office. And uh, Bob Straub, Democrat Bob Straub, succeeded him as governor. So I was in the vanguard of this first post-McCall generation of legislators. And uh, it, was a, it was really a, uh, a learning curve. And as a wise person once told me, the most important challenge for any freshman is to build credibility. So I undertook to try to do my homework, so to speak, do my part in the work of the committees of which I was a member, try to be informed uh, about matters that came before the House, and uh, also try to be diligent in dealing with my constituent contacts stay abreast of my correspondence. This was all, of course, before personal computers. Uh, so everything was either done by phone or by, by typed letter, basically. Um, so in these ways, I tried to, uh, to, to build a, a reputation among members of somebody who could be counted on to do his share of the work. There were elements of factional division that I think I felt pretty early in my tenure. And over time, those factional divisions hardened, I think, would be a fair way to describe it, such that uh, in my third term, the 1977 session, there eventually broke out a kind of conservative democratic Republican combination to uh, overthrow the existing authority of the speaker. It represented, perhaps from a historical standpoint, the most serious break in the kind of orderly organization of the House that had occurred, or at least certainly in modern times. I had been recognized as a candidate for speaker after the seventh the session adjourned. And gradually, through a process of discussions, uh, the majority of the Dem members of the Democratic Caucus centered their support on me. But there was a, that was about a 23 or 24 vote uh, group out of what would be ultimately 34 members. And the rest uh, were uh, otherwise committed, at least temporarily. Gradually, that number grew of my support group grew to 30. So we had four holdouts, Democratic holdouts, as we came into the start of the 79 session. And when that deadlock persisted, we sought to open negotiation with the Republicans to see if they would be willing to support my election as speaker in exchange for certain enhanced power within the committee structure. The Republicans were no negotiating not just for their own members, 26 of them, but also for these four Democratic holdouts. So the total array of demands was pretty sweeping and such that it, it uh, revived discussions between the majority Democrats and the four holdouts. And that ultimately produced an agreement which resulted in my election as speaker. Question of where did I start once um, I was elected? I think I decided that I wanted to, first of all, uh, lead a way to a certain amount of rules reform in the House. 
Bearing in mind the overthrow of Speaker Lang's powers, but not entirely motivated by that, in part motivated by a genuine interest in seeing the House organize itself more along principal partisan lines. Uh, in, the, in that we elect by party, and I thought we ought to we ought to organize the House more clearly in a way of party accountability. As I think back on the 1979 session, the, uh, the issue that stands out most vividly in my mind was the legislature's effort to, uh, to counter the movement toward trying to place uh, severe restrictions on local government finance. Uh, this was a struggle that went on for four or six years, eight years, for the decisions of the people of Oregon. In 79, the session undertook a variety of, ref of changes, commitments of general fund, basically, by way of increased property tax relief, refund of surplus income tax revenues, the creation of the kicker program. Uh, these were paramount elements of a total effort by the legislature to convince the people of Oregon to turn aside what would yet be another proposal going on the ballot to restrict uh, local government property tax finance. Well, I think it was viewed as yet another way of convincing Oregonians that state government was serious about constraining its own expenditure level so that this structure was intended to uh, prevent the accumulation, I guess you could say, of resources beyond what was basically what was budgeted as needed. As I look back on it, I consider it one of the most serious of the public policy mistakes that I may have been associated with. Because for one thing, it, it really hamstrung the ability to create a rainy day fund which could be used to smooth out differences in revenue biennium to biennium without necessarily having to plunge us plunge the legislature into highly damaging and disruptive budget adjustments i think the office is the most wonderful uh, position in state government, especially for a lawyer who's interested in good government. The Attorney General's power, when you really get down to it, if you want to know where is that power, a key power, it is in this ability to give legal guidance to the agencies. Because if the Attorney General tells an agency that something it wants to do is unlawful, then the agency isn't going to do it. Now, that's a huge power. And I felt my aspiration for that overall work was that it be done excellently and that it be done uh, free of distortion by some perception of my personal preferences. The most important litigation that occurred, public litigation that occurred during my tenure as Attorney General was the was the lawsuit Oregon filed against the major tobacco manufacturers. Now that was, lawsuit was paralleled by similar lawsuits filed by most other states. So it wasn't a unique Oregon undertaking. But um, building off of a claim essentially of deception in the marketing of tobacco as to its health risks primarily, this combination of litigation uh, ultimately produced the National Master Tobacco Master Settlement Agreement, so-called, by which not only were significant 
sums of money committed to be paid to the states on a perpetual basis, actually. But there were put in place a variety of restrictions, primarily on advertising, designed, targeted toward youth, mostly, that also sought to give the, the agreement this very important uh, health component. The death with dignity case was the among those seven that I mentioned. That was the by far the most uh, prominent in terms of public awareness in Oregon, and uh, it basically arose from the Bush administration's decision to interpret the Federal Controlled Substances Act in a way that said that. Oregon lawyer, doctors who were complying with the Death with Dignity Act, according to its terms, were nonetheless in violation of federal law and faced loss of their prescription writing privileges, which of course would mean their medical practice, as well as potential criminal, criminal sanctions. We sued in U.S. District Court in Portland, in Oregon, to challenge that interpretation of federal law. And that's, it wasn't entirely a question of federal law because the Oregon law as such had already been through a litigation process and had been upheld. The question of what the federal law meant was the issue. Ultimately, the Supreme Court, a majority of the court agreed that the interpretation being given by the U.S. Attorney General and Department of Justice by the Bush administration were incorrect as a matter of law, that they were acting unlawfully. And so that's how the case arose and was ultimately resolved. We convened a conference in the summer of 1999, statewide conference, to assess the quality of the response to sexual assault in Oregon. And I think, to be fair to say, it was deplorable. Very low amount of law enforcement training, um, very inadequate resources in terms of nurse examiners. I mean, the whole, the whole notion of a kind of coordinated community response to sexual assault was, was uh, imaginary. So it was with that in mind that this uh, desire arose to have an attorney general headed task force created, which could be a driver, organizer and driver for initiatives dealing with law enforcement training, with the, uh, the, the training and availability of sexual assault nurse examiners. Those were two of the primary areas of professional training that were to be focused on. And it's really the, the task force that has been that driver in those years since then for various efforts undertaken to coordinate a community response to sexual assault. I forget who it was, which historian, who described the practice of American democracy as a ceaseless quest for remedies. And I think that is a really wonderful way to think about our politics. And so I'm very sad and I'm not lacking an understanding of why so many people are turned off by politics or turned off by government or angry or whatever, particularly with the economic hardships so many people face. And I'm not being oblivious to that. But by the same token, I guess, my feeling is that that's, that's a luxury, this disdain for our system of government, that we, that is really, really a kind of a betrayal in a way of what has come down to us from the fathers. And I just, think we owe it to the country, to our 
ideals to view politics as a very noble and important undertaking.